Hi, I'm Dr. Stevens, uh, Eric Stevens. I'm an endocrinologist with Hogue Medical Group over in Huntington Harbor. And I'm just going to give you this talk about living a successful life with diabetes. All right, so we're just going to talk about some objectives. So basically, um, we're just going to talk about the significance of diabetes and uh, its prevalence in the community, uh, how we diagnose it, uh, some misconceptions um, about diabetes, and then we'll start getting into um, appropriate ways to tell how well your diabetes is controlled and how we can uh, keep control with both medications as well as um, diet and exercise regimens. Um, and then we'll also do a little bit about diabetes medication and technology. Okay, so diabetes is a really common disease in the United States. So this is a little bit older, but 2015, there's about 30.3 million people with diabetes. And uh, we're mostly talking about type 2 diabetes. Um, type 1 diabetes is also um, uh, fairly common, but uh, much less common than type 2 diabetes. Um, and then it gets older, since we're talking about, uh, we're at the senior center here. So senior 65 and older, it's almost about a quarter of the population. Um, so quite a lot. OK, and so we're talking about diagnosis. Um, so there's three different ways to diagnose diabetes. Um, we tend to use one more uh, called the A1C, which is kind of an average of your sugars over the previous three months. So when you do an A1C, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're fasting or if you just ate. Um, you can do it at any time. So it's a little bit more convenient, and it'll give you an average of what you were doing over uh, the previous three months in terms of your sugars. Uh, so that's the most common way. And uh, so if you're um, 5.7, sorry, less than 5.7, you would have, um, uh, you'd be normal. Di Prediabetes is 5.7 to 6.4, and then 6.5 and higher is diabetes. Um, another way we can diagnose diabetes that's pretty common is people usually go see their primary care doctor and they have a, a fasting glucose checked, which is usually on a common lab called the metabolic panel. And um, when we look at that, that has to be fasting. If you're normal in terms of your sugars, it would be less than 100. If it's between 100 uh, to 125, then that's considered prediabetes. And then it's considered diabetes 126 and higher. And then the last type of way to diagnose is with a thing called the oral glucose tolerance test, which is not used that commonly. It's more done in pregnant women for gestational diabetes. Um, you basically have to swallow this uh, not very good tasting syrup that's full of sugar, and then you wait around for an hour or two hours, and they t test your sugar after that. So that's another way to diagnose diabetes, but uh, less done than the other two. Okay, so we talked a little bit about types of diabetes. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. So uh, your body generates these antibodies that can um, uh, slowly destroy or quickly destroy the insulin produ uh, producing cells in your pancreas called beta cells. And uh, so the people with type 1 diabetes, they will need insulin only for treatment. So all the medications that you see on TV uh, that are advertised for diabetes, unless they're insulin, they can't be used for type 1 diabetics. Um, typically, it's meant for young, uh, it's diagnosed in younger age groups, but it can happen at any time. I've had patients who are 50, 60 years old and still get um, late onset type 1 diabetes. Um, type 2 diabetes is usually uh, is the bigger bulk, I said, as of patients. And um, that's because uh, people develop insulin resistance. So um, unlike type 1, where insulin is the only thing that can be used, um, for type 2, there's insulin can be used, but as well as a bunch of other oral medications and non-insulin medications that we can use to help lower the insulin resistance um, and help you lower your sugars. So typically, type 2 is a bit easier to control, especially earlier on in uh, the disease. Um, than type 1, um, and it's typically diagnosed at older age groups. And um, you know these patients are more associated with weight and, and family history of diabetes as opposed to the type 1 diabetics. And then there's other uh, smaller subsets of diabetes, like gestational diabetes when you get it in pregnancy, and steroid-induced diabetes, but 
we don't really need to go over those today. Okay, so type 2 diabetes, okay. So a lot of people have preconceived notions about type 2 diabetes because it is so common. Um, it doesn't only have to happen in overweight and obese people. So not everyone that has, is overweight and obese has type 2, and not everyone who um, has type 2 is overweight and obese. So um, it's a risk factor in terms of obesity, but there's a lot of other factors like your ethnicity, your um, age, family history, you know, your nutrition, um, exercise level. So there's a lot of reasons why people may or may not develop type 2 diabetes. And actually, type 2 diabetes is more tightly linked to family history uh, than type 1. So a lot of people think type 1 is just kind of a genetic one, but it happens sporadically too, so it doesn't have to necessarily be within your family. Um, same thing with type 2, but there is a stronger genetic disposition to type 2 diabetes. Um, and then a lot of people think if you need insulin, you might have type 1 diabetes, but as I said before, type 2 uh, also can require insulin treatment. Usually we try non-insulin medications first, but um, if that's not good enough, then we'll move on to using insulin. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about what makes sugars go up and down. Okay, so there's a lot of factors. There's only a couple things that we can control. Uh, the two primary things we can control are the medication we're taking and then our diet and exercise. So the things like eating carbohydrates uh, or sugars, sugars which, turn in, uh, which uh, are basically the same as carbohydrates, um, they increase your sugars. Okay, so we want to limit the amount of that. Um, insulin or uh, giving insulin or making insulin is a way you can decrease your sugars. Um, and then um, there's also many other hormones that affect uh, your sugars. So these things like cortisol, growth hormone, glucagon, epinephrine, these aren't hormones that we can necessarily control or target um, in our therapies yet for diabetes. Um, but for example, like cortisol is considered a stress hormone. So when people are under a lot of stress, uh, the cortisol levels can be higher and that can contribute to higher sugars when you're feeling under stress. Um, uh, let's see, epinephrine, so that's similar to uh, uh, cortisol in the sense that it's a stress hormone, so that's the same thing as adrenaline, so um, all these things can push and pull your sugars. Um, so sometimes when people have diabetes, they ask me like, you know, why is my sugar going up at a certain time or down? And sometimes it's really hard to answer. I mean, there's a lot of different factors that go on. Um, but we think about some of these other hormones that may play a role, so like pain, stress, and not just necessarily, you know, what you were eating that day or, or what you were doing for exercise. Okay, so what are our goals for sugar control? So if you're newly diagnosed, younger, as in I would say, I don't know, under 65, 70, um, and there's no other major medical problems, we should try and keep your A1C less than 7%. Okay, so that's as per the American Diabetes Association, um, and so that's our goal uh, in the beginning. There is an argument to make the set point a little bit higher, so less than 8%. If you've had diabetes for a long time, say greater than 5, 10, 20 years, uh, if you're older, um, or you have multiple other complications already from diabetes. And the reason for that is, um, as we try and keep your sugars lower, like less than 7%, then um, your risk for having low blood sugars increases. And in people who are older or have heart conditions or stroke, uh, previous stroke, um, they're less able to tolerate low blood sugars when we, um, when we try and push the sugars down. So they actually become, uh, it can be dangerous to try and keep their sugar too low. So you kind of have to find a balance between an A1C of seven to 8% for um, those types of patients. Um, okay, and so what does the A1C of seven and eight correlate with? So A1C is 7% is basically if you average your sugar for three months, like every minute of every day, and then it came out to 150. There's kind of a preference for the, the most recent preceding month, but 
overall, I would just say, you know, the prior three months average of 150. And then an A1C of 8% is about 180 average. Um, when you're checking at home with your glucometer, uh, that would correlate with fasting sugars like 80 to 130. So when you're checking in the morning before you eat, you want to keep your sugars around there. And then uh, if you do two hours after a meal, before lunch or dinner or a bedtime, then we're looking for 80 to 180. And if you get most of your sugars within those ranges, then we would expect the A1C to be um, uh, hitting those targets. Okay, so when to check your sugars. Okay, so um, if you're just on one to two medications or even none and just doing diet control, uh, you don't need to check your sugars really that often. I would just say about a fasting sugar once in a while, so in the morning before you eat, um, and you try and make sure it stays within like the 80 to 130 range, uh, like we said. So um, if that's how many medications you're taking, then that's really all you need to do. I would check sometimes uh, two hours after meal, but otherwise fasting is good enough. Uh, if you're starting to get on more, like multiple medications, three to four, or you're on like a once a day insulin, then you wanna start checking more, um, probably at least once a day, two times a day for um, that situation. And you wanna check different times of day. So you wanna do fasting or um, two hours after meal and, uh, and, and see if you're hitting those targets. And then if you're on multiple daily injections of insulin, so up to like three or four a day, uh, either with or without orals, then you wanna check at least four times a day, three to four times a day. So before each meal and bedtime, so that would add up to three to four. Okay, so um, a lot of people hate poking their finger, so they ask a lot about these continuous glucose uh, monitor devices. So um, the, right now, the uh, most up-to-date ones are the Dexcom G6, there's a Freestyle Libre 2, Medtronic Guardian, and then in, there's an implantable one called the Eversense. Um, for most patients, these are not necessary if you're just on like one or two uh, pills um, and your A1C is pretty well controlled. You don't really need these. It gives us more information than you need. I've had a couple of patients who still want them and they use them and it works well for them because they uh, like to see what, you know, when they eat, how much the sugar rises, and then they can modify their diet in relation to how much their sugar is rising. So for that sort of situation, it could be useful, but um, normally if you're just on a couple oral medications, you don't need this. You can just check your finger sticks. This is more for people who have not very good control, uh, on multiple daily doses of insulin. So we need, they need to be checking three to four times a day. So this helps them do that without poking their finger three to four times a day. And it gives us a lot of good data in determining you know, how to adjust the insulin. So if you're just on pills, you, know, it's, you don't use the data as much to figure out how to adjust the medication. It's more based on A1C as opposed to the actual sugars. Um, and it's also very useful, especially for elderly patients who are on insulin, uh, because there's alarms on them. So it'll trigger, if you're about to go less than 70 or 80, uh, it'll set up an alarm. So it's very good for safety because, uh, you know, when you get older, like I said, or even when you're not older, but uh, when you start getting lower sugars, the hypoglycemia can be dangerous. So it can help, help you figure out when you're about to go low. Okay. So how to lower and maintain your sugars. Okay, so this, we'll start talking with medication. So metformin is considered the first line medication for type two. So usually uh, we start with this medication if someone's A1C is you know, starting to go over seven and they feel like they've made all the dietary modifications and exercise that they can, then we usually start with metformin. Uh, if they can't tolerate that, I mean, the, usually the most common thing would be like diarrhea or upset stomach. Uh, then we'll move on to one of these other ones down below. But if it's able to be tolerated, then we usually start it and increase it to the maximum dose if we need to. Okay, so there's a bunch of other things here that we can use in addition to metformin. 
uh, if we still need better control. Uh, so if your A1C is still not hitting the target, um, there's uh, medications called GLP agonists, um, which are like Trulicity, Ozempic, Victoza is kind of an older iteration, and uh, Rebelsis. Okay, so these ones probably have seen on TV because they're all under brand and they advertise heavily. Um, they're actually quite good. So I've had a lot of good success and a lot of endocrinologists do. Um, they're probably the most powerful in terms of lowering A1C uh, of all the medications on there except for insulin. Um, so they give very good A1C reduction typically. Uh, they can also uh, cause a significant amount of weight loss. So, um, so that's very useful for a lot of diabetes patients. Um, so the weight loss will help lower your A1C, but it also you know, will improve your cholesterol, blood pressure, and a lot of other things that are, that are helpful other than just the diabetes. Um, the only issue is that they're injectable. So the, um, the Trulicity and Ozempic is basically injectable once a week, whereas the um, Rebelsis is the exact same drug as Ozempic, but it's in a pill form. Um, so some people have problems with doing injections, so sometimes we'll do the Rebelsis instead of the Trulicity or Ozempic. They help slow your stomach from emptying as quickly, so people feel fuller, longer, and quicker. Uh, so they don't eat as much, so people lose usually a substantial amount of weight with these medications. And actually just a couple weeks ago, the, um, the uh, I think it's called Wicovi, the is, it was recently approved for just weight loss, not even in diabetics. So it's a medication you, that was FDA approved just uh, to cause weight loss. And it's the exact same drug as Ozempic, just rebranded at a higher dose. So that overall just leads credence to how well these can help uh, lower people's sugar, uh, sugars and also their weight. Okay, so the next category, SGLT2, probably seen these on TV too, Invokana, Jardians, Farxiga. So these are all under brand two, so no generics yet. Um, they help you pee out your sugars more. Um, they can cause increased risk for urinary tract infection and yeast infection, but overall they're pretty well tolerated. Um, and they actually have a sick, good um, indication for people with heart disease, so they can reduce um, major adverse cardiovascular events. So usually people with diabetes and some form of heart disease, especially heart failure, uh, we try to add one of those because uh, uh, it kind of gives you a double effect there. Okay, so sulfonylureas, glipizide, glyburide, um, glimepiride, those uh, are all generic. They're older like metformin is, and so um, they tend to be cheaper sometimes um, if that becomes an issue uh, with the other medications. Um, they can overshoot and cause low blood sugars, which can be dangerous, unlike the other two categories. Um, but they do a good job at lowering A1C and they may cause a little bit of weight gain. Um, but sometimes we use them just because of cost issues. Um, this category here, DPP4, so Geneva, Genuvia, Trigenta, and Glyza. Uh, I believe all these are still on brand as well, so sometimes can be more expensive like the first two categories. They tend to be a bit weaker in lowering A1C, so if you need a lot of A1C reduction, then we might use a different category than that. Actose is old and generic, um, pioglitazone, just like the metformin and the sulfonylureas. Uh, that can cause the most weight gain of any of these, so I try to not use it if possible. Um, it can cause some lower extremity swelling. Um, so it's not my favorite one, but it's still a, an option um, if we need to use it. Um, and then there's insulin, okay? So there's long-acting, short-acting insulin, um, and uh, we can get a little bit more into that in the future. Okay, so a lot of times um, people feel like they've been doing the same thing and their A1C's been pretty good for a little while, uh, but all of a sudden, you know, maybe over the last year, six months, they notice that the A1C starts creeping up, but they feel like they've been doing the same thing and they're questioning, you know, why is it going up? And part of the reason is uh, there is a progression to type two diabetes. So the insulin making cells in your pancreas, they can slowly start to die off um, the longer you have diabetes or if the insulin cells are under stress. Um, 
And so you may not have as much insulin production that you did in the beginning of the disease as opposed to you know, 10, 20 years later. So a lot of people are not just on metformin, for example, for like 20 years. They typically will need maybe one or two or more additional medications to help keep the A1C uh, down. Um, okay, and then C-peptides. So your doctor or endocrinologist can check this to see how much insulin your body's making. Um, and sometimes if that's, you know, you've had diabetes for a while and that value is very low, even though when the sugar's high, then that just means those medications that are not insulin, they may not work as well potentially um, uh, than as they would otherwise. Okay, so this just talks about insulins. Um, so there's a bunch of different long-acting insulins you give them. Uh, once or twice per day. So these are all the different kinds right now. Um, they help target your fasting sugar. So when you're on that, we look at what your fasting sugar is and we adjust it to see if we need to raise or lower your fasting sugar. Okay. And then there's the short acting. So there's Novolog, Humalog, Epidra. They're all sort of considered equivalent, I would say. Um, and so uh, these you give before each meal. So this is where the number of injections per day starts adding up. So um, if you eat three times a day, then you have to start injecting it before each meal about five to 10 minutes before the meal. And it targets your mealtime sugars. Uh, so basically the long acting insulins don't do anything really uh, much at all with your uh, stopping the rise of your sugars after food. Uh, these will help a lot, the short acting insulins. Okay, so full insulin regimen would be one long acting injection plus three short acting. Sometimes if you're on very high doses of the long acting, we might split it up into two injections instead of one. So some people might even do five injections a day. These are a bit older uh, insulins. They're still used sometime. I think Kaiser still uses NPH uh, primarily. Uh, I don't use these that frequently, mostly because these tend to be a bit better in getting smoother control, I would say. There's nothing wrong with these per se, but uh, it's sort of a different dosing um, regimen and, and is a little bit less flexible, I would say. Okay, so hypoglycemia. So I've definitely emphasized that low blood sugars can be dangerous as well. Um, and so, yeah, if you're on insulin or anything that can cause low blood sugars like those sulfonylurea medications like glipizide, glyburide, glimepiride, then you want to make sure you're carrying like glucose tablets or gel, hard candies, juice, soda, something uh, nearby to you. And so we usually say you want 15 grams of carb, uh, which is like four ounces of you know, orange juice or something like that, and you recheck the sugar in 15 minutes and make sure it's going up. If it hasn't gone up, then you just repeat the cycle until it starts going up. You want to try and limit overdoing it. Like I've had patients like, you know, eat a whole bunch of food or like a piece of cake or something, and then the sugar kind of like rockets right back up. Uh, so you, you don't really want to do that. You, you do want to correct it, but you want to kind of just do it incrementally if possible. And then um, uh, for type 1s or even type 2s, we sometimes prescribe a thing called a glucagon kit. So. Um, this is for people who uh, have frequent lows or are on insulin, and they, um, if they have a low so quickly that they pass out, then this could be given by someone who lives with you at the time um, as an injection into your shoulder muscle here or the thigh, and, uh, and it can help raise your sugar. Because if you're unconscious, you obviously can't have juice or hard candies or whatever else. So this medication will help increase the sugars you know, while you're waiting for the paramedics to come. So it can be life-saving. Um, but typically, I don't prescribe it for type 2s unless they're having a lot of low sugars. It's more for type 1s. Um, and another dangerous thing is hypoglycemic unawareness. So you can basically, if you have a lot of low blood sugars, people can become kind of blunted to the response of having low blood sugar so they can have sugars in the 60s, but they may not be feeling it anymore because they've been having a lot of low blood sugars before. And so that can be dangerous. So that's why you want to limit how many times you have low blood sugars. 
if possible. Okay, so screening. So when you go see the doctor for diabetes, uh, they should be doing these things, you know, yearly at least. Uh, so uh, the high sugars can damage your eyes, kidneys, and nerves. Okay, so you should do this thing called microalbumin once a year um, as a screening test to see if there's any protein coming out in your urine um, uh, because that will tell us if there's early signs of kidney disease. Um, eye screening, so people can either do like a dilated exam or a um, retinal uh, photo at their doctor, uh, uh, doctor's office. And uh, uh, that's to look at the retina to see if there's any damage from the diabetes in your eye. And then monofilament is a little like um, plastic little uh, filament that you just kind of poke the bottom of your foot uh, that the doctor will do and see if you feel any numbness um, or if you can't feel the filament at all, then that means you might be developing neuropathy. Okay, so we usually screen for those things as we're going along um, in treating diabetes. And then uh, cholesterol is also important. So diabetes can also increase your risk for stroke and heart attack. So, do high, so does high cholesterol. So um, we often consider using a thing called a statin to help reduce risk of stroke and heart attack if your cholesterol is beyond a certain amount and you have diabetes. We tend to be a little bit more aggressive in patients with diabetes and lowering the cholesterol just because there's that increased risk. Um, blood pressure is also important, again, for stroke and heart attack risk. Uh, you wanna be trying to keep it under that number at least. Uh, you can check it at home. Usually it's a bit higher in the doctor's office, so it's also good to check at home and see what you're getting. Um, yeah, and so this is the whole point of why we're trying to keep your sugars lower to prevent these complications. Um, okay, so this kind of just reiterates what I just said on the previous slide. So basically as your A1C is increasing here, your risk uh, can increase many fold higher uh, for all these conditions, okay? So the difference between someone with an A1C of nine for retinopathy versus someone seven is multiple fold higher uh, in terms of developing or worsening of uh, the risk of developing uh, these complications. Okay, diet. So there isn't one diet, I would say, that fits everyone's needs. Um, it's a complicated topic that you could go on for a while, and that's why there's diabetes educators and nutritionists that help um, to help me and, and the other physicians uh, in terms of going over what to do for um, patients with diabetes and their diet. But the general gist is you're trying to have lower carb diets. So um, you want to avoid things like potatoes, rice, tortillas, bread, obviously desserts and candy. So you don't have to eliminate those things completely. You just want to uh, limit the portion. So portion control is kind of key to that. Um, you prefer to have things that are lower in glycemic index, <clears throat> which is basically things like a um, common comparison would be like wild rice or brown rice versus white rice. So lower glycemic index just means that it'll release the sugar more slowly. So that's why we suggest you know, brown rice or wild rice as opposed to white rice. Um, uh, and then eating out, okay? So if you don't do any of these things and you still have carbs, at least try not to eat out because basically you don't know what's going into the food and they're trying to make it tasty, which usually involves adding a lot of fat or carb into it as well. Um, so they don't really care if you have diabetes. Okay, uh, so good foods to have. Okay, so I said legumes on here and then beans. Those, so those have some carb, like I said, but they have good, um, good levels of fiber and protein. Um, leafy green vegetables. So there's nothing really bad about them, I would say, for diabetes. Um, they're very little carb, there's low calorie, there's a lot of good nutrients in them. Um, people ask about fruit. So fruit does have carbohydrate in it because there's sugar. It doesn't matter if it's natural sugar or not. Um, try to have things that are not tropical fruits, so like mango, papaya, uh, pineapple, those all have like a really 
higher sugar content than things like berries and apples. Um, so you can still have those things, but again, just be mindful of the portion size. Um, okay, um, meats. Meats are fine. They don't really raise the carb. They're just protein. Um, try and pick leaner cuts of meat like pork or beef or uh, leaner meats in general like chicken and fish. Um, eggs are good. Some people remove the yolks because of the fat components. So if you do egg whites, that's fine too. Um, water. So water's best. Um, some people hate the taste of water, so they have to think of something else. Um, you can do like the sparkling waters um, that have like that kind of flavoring in it, but it's not really any carb in it. Uh, if you really want to have soda or something, at least do diet, even though diet is still not wonderful, but it's better, at least in terms of your sugars, than uh, regular soda. And then, um, yeah, so uh, don't sweeten your tea or coffee if possible. Okay, so exercise. So uh, I wouldn't worry about this, but this is basically just how you can build up and write out you know, an exercise regimen. But um, yeah, so the American Diabetes Association recommends 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise for five days a week. So basically, you know, vigorous would be defined as you can't really um, sing, but you can still talk. So you can say a couple of words. So you want to get it so where you're feeling a little bit out of breath, so to speak, um, and getting your heart rate up. Um, and then you can also add in some resistance exercise. You don't have to be lifting like heavy weights or anything, but even just resistance bands or, um, you know, light weights uh, would be helpful. Okay. And then um, this is, so diabetes is a complex thing. So there's the doctor, but you really need like a multidisciplinary team if you um, have trouble, you know, sticking with some of the recommendations. So um, the doctor will go over your medications, kind of be like the quarterback, so to speak, of the care. But um, sometimes it's useful if you've never been to see either a diabetes educator or a nutritionist um, who's specific to diabetes, and uh, they can give you a lot of input on how to um, follow some of the recommendations I just mentioned. And they're usually more knowledgeable in those aspects of care um, than the physician, even in terms of diet and, and exercise sometimes. Um, mental health, so I just put that in there because you have to be able to you know, take care of yourself. So a lot of people have issues with depression or they're, um, you know, caring for other family members and, you know, they have a lot of difficulty trying to control their own diabetes because they're worried about a lot of other things. And so, um, you know, if you're feeling depressed, you should try and address some of those situations first um, because that's going to really limit your capacity to, um, to follow these recommendations and, you know, try to uh, keep your diabetes under control. And yeah, so the, the Hogue has a diabetes center in, in Newport and Irvine. Um, I don't know if they're doing the cooking demonstrations again yet, but they used to have like free cooking demonstrations that you could go to um, about you know certain meals. And the guy who does them actually has type one diabetes, so you know he's pretty knowledgeable about what to eat and not. Um, and then they also have diabetes educators there as well. Okay, so this is kind of what I was talking about in terms of depression. Um, I think what's also important is uh, I have a lot of patients who come with like family members um, so they can hear, you know, what we talk about at the visit and helps them, uh, helps encourage them to be supportive of their family. Uh, so it's not, it's useful if you're, you don't have to have your whole family have a, you know, diabetes friendly diet, but at least they can uh, understand like what you're trying to do and be more supportive of um, how you need to eat certain things, exercise a certain way to kind of achieve your health goals there. Um, yeah, and even if you can't do an established exercise regimen, even just walking after meals, just not being sedentary is good for mental health plus also your sugars. So um, try and just stay active and, and motivated if possible. Okay, and then I'm here at Huntington Harbor, and that's basically it. Are there any questions? 
You mean like the graph? Over 150, that, that puts you in a diabetic uh, range, right? So diabetic range, there isn't, diabetic range would be defined as the things I mentioned with the A1C. So like if A1C is higher, 6.5 or higher, that'd be considered diabetes range. But these values, a normal person can have these values. It's just that overall, someone with diabetes would have, um, on average, not just these values, but ones that are higher. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand that. But okay. I was just, just wondering, is there such a thing as having too low of a blood sugar or too, and what is the maximum that a person can uh, have a normal life uh, at the highest rate? Uh, yes, you can have too low of a sugar. So that was hypoglycemia, like I mentioned, when the sugar is less than 70. So below yeah, 70 to 80. Um, usually that won't happen though, if unless you're taking like insulin or, one, or that other style of medication I mentioned. Because if you're on those other medications, they, the mechanism doesn't push your sugar too low usually. Um, and your body does a really good job of fighting off a low on its own, unless it's a medication pushing it down. So like, you know, if I starve for a couple days, I'm still not necessarily going to have a low blood sugar because there's stores coming out from your liver and other hormones that release the sugar into your bloodstream to keep it up. But if you use a medication that can quickly bring it down, then that's when it becomes dangerous. Um, so that's, that would be too low. Too high, I mean, there isn't really an answer for too high. Really, you just want to make sure the average is, yeah, 7% or less. Any other questions? All right, thank you.